Hello and welcome to Change Your Story, Change Your Life. I'm your host, Mitch Austin. So glad you could be with us today. And we have an amazing show for you today with a very special guest. You know, Change Your Story, Change Your Life came out of a class that I offer called Rise and Speak. And it's where I work with people over the course of seven weeks to look at their lives pick out a defining moment and put a message around it, kind of making your mess your message, and then speaking that message publicly for other people to gain love, hope, and transformation from your story. And I've been teaching this for quite a while. And in fact, our guest today has done the class. So he might tell us a little more about it. We're actually going to be doing our first ever class online in November. So if this class speaks to you, there's going to be a link dropped with my uh, contact information. So reach out to me if you're interested, I'll get you more information. And hopefully you can be one of the nine people that will be in our first ever virtual class. Also, if you're interested in transformational coaching or assistance with public speaking, reach out to me, I'd be happy to support you. So I am super excited to announce our guest today, Rod Malloy, so grateful you could be with us. Rod has his roots in Connecticut and New York. Rod has guided nonprofit organizations across the United States, raising over $50 million on behalf of the aging adults, children at risk, seniors, human human trafficking, victims, homeless veterans, nature conservation, and environmental protection causes. Rod is a filmmaker, storyteller, professional public speaker. Rod inspires audiences with stories from indigenous people and cultures with special emphasis on aging adult services, intergenerational trends, social media, civic leadership, and climate change. Wow, what powerful work. Rod is also was an Eagle Scout, and he's a proud father of two adult children, Rod enjoys serving the local community and equipping people from each generation for positive change and success. Welcome to the show, Rod. So glad you're here today. Great to be here with you, Mitch. Good to see you again. Excellent. What part of the world are you in, Rod, and what are you up to today? I am located in downtown Sacramento, California, the capital of the great state of California. And these days I'm a filmmaker. I'm working with a local production company called Gilliam Media Production and my partner, Matthew Gilliam. And I'm in the process of working on several different film projects, all that are documentary style films, one that is a feature documentary and two that are documentary series. Awesome. So amazing. And and what was the first documentary you did? Because I remember you mentioning that to me. The first documentary that we're still producing is called Un-American Justice, and we've released the pilot episode, which uh, has been selected for a dozen film festivals and recently won Best Short Documentary at the Seattle Filmmaker Film Festival. Awesome. That's so cool. Congratulations. I know how much work has went into this. Yes, a lot of travel, a lot of work, and also a great backstory. (laughs) <laughs> well, and speaking of that, you didn't start out as a filmmaker. Um, you've had quite a journey. In fact, if your life were a book, what would the title be, Rod? I've wrestled with the title and I really feel comfortable with because it, it can like words can be misinterpreted. So um, I would say um, uh, from waking to from sleeping to waking and that that's the title with the subtitle living out your dreams oh i love that i love that yeah because your journey at one point you you kind of felt like you were asleep until you had some pretty amazing mystical experiences as i recall that woke you up that woke you up what was the first part of that awakening? Maybe you can kind of take us into that scene and what was going on with your life at that moment. Well, I just realized after you read that introduction that it has 
ancestral and intergenerational implications, the story. Um, I hate talking about COVID, but it's a COVID story. So I got COVID early in the history of COVID, um, winter of 2020, mm. and got it really bad. Lost my sense of smell, lo uh, lost my sense of taste, stopped eating, fighting off the, the horrible virus. And I got to the point where I lifted up my hands and my heart to God, to the universe, mm -hmm. and said, I have lived a great life. And I don't really need to live anymore if I'm going to lose this battle against the virus. And I basically said, uh, take me. Uh, finally fell asleep after three days of zero sleep, no rest, fighting off the virus, and had the most vivid dream of my life. And the dream was guided by my grandmother, Ruth Adams Donnelly Malloy, my dad's mother. And she took me on an RV trip to see places like the Badlands and Mount Rushmore and Standing Rock and George Floyd's memorial. Wow. And in the dream, it was so vivid. I woke up, I felt like I had been to all of those places. But I decided anyway to grab my phone and Google one-way RV rental to mm -hmm. see how much it would cost to actually rent an RV and, and take the trip. And when I got the results, I was so blown away. I sent a group text at, I think it was six o'clock in the morning to the filmmaker partners saying, would you like, or are you available to meet with me? I've got a, an idea for a film project that relates to an RV trip. Mm -hmm. So the one way cost to rent an RV in uh, April of 2020 from El Monte RV rental company was $137. <laughs> Across the United so, States? Yes, 2,200 miles. You're kidding miles, me. 2,200 miles, $137. And I've shared that story with people. Just to, It's fun to see what they guess. Most people guess between $1,000 <laughs> and $10,000. Right, to right. It. But it, I didn't believe it myself, so I opened up my laptop, did the same Google search, clicked on the same link, got the same result. So then I sent the text message. A week later, we had the meeting. A month later, I flew out a film crew to Chicago, rented the RV, and it started the process of interviewing people um, in places like Standing Rock and mm. um, Chicago, uh, in Reno, in San Diego, other places for the film that has become the documentary series, Un-American Justice. Fantastic. And it's now getting like awards and all kinds of uh, attention. What, when yes. do when do you think the the film will be completed? Um, I'm I'm really confident that there's a person or people, uh, private equity that will step up to be co-producers along with me to fund the last part of the process, which is all post production, mm. um, sound editing, maybe mm. a, a professional voice, um, music, all the final touches to make the film series great. Um, I, I need to raise money to, to make that happen. And I think I'm very close to that point to do that. Cool. And what's really exciting for me, as time passes, I feel closer and closer to my grandmother, who I lost um, mm. tw 25 years ago. Mm. And um, she's very, very close to me and encouraging me. And even in some cases, mm. helping me make choices and guiding me to... Uh, embellish, enhance, enliven the story to make the film series even better. And one example of that, episodes one, two, three, and four will all, will all be about indigenous people, including the local Nisanan people yes. here in uh, the, the Central Valley that's by Sacramento. Mm. And um, the fourth episode will relate to slavery related to California Indian tribes. Wow. which is a part of the American genocide that occurred uh, right around the time of the gold rush and the Civil War. So from 1847 to 1880, that's when over 300,000 California Indians were either massacred or died mm -hmm. due to disease or mm -hmm. slavery or um, whatever. Mm -hmm. But people don't realize that slavery, slavery was a big part of that life in the beginning part of California. Hmm. And we're going to make that connection uh, at the end of the fourth episode. The fifth mm -hmm. episode will be about Caribbean slavery and American slavery. 
So we go from indigenous people and their view of the American, the American dream in episodes one through four, five, six, seven episodes will be uh, Caribbean and American slavery and descendants mm -hmm. of slaves and their view of the American, dra American dream. And mm -hmm. then the final six or seven episodes will be immigrant and refugee stories and their view of the American dream. Wow, that is fantastic. I, I really love how granular this film is getting on the subject because I think we have some some really limited uh, understanding of just how widespread slavery was at that time and and all the peoples that were affected um, by that practice. And 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 when you say uh, the, their, their version of American dream, is that real time or is that when they went back in history? It's real time. It's okay. very current. It's the, say the 2020 to 2023, 24 view of the American dream, depending of when the people were interviewed. So it's current, it's contemporary views of the American dream. Awesome. But, but they all talk about their ancestors. So there's oh. that ancestral influence on their view of the American dream. Sure. Uh, yeah, I really love how you're contrasting people's experience and knowledge around this subject, because it seems like it colors what people think of as a dream moving forward, given what their history of their family and how they identify and see themselves in that history. Um, which I think is really powerful. It, and as you know, I'm really passionate about stories and, and the ability for stories as you are, right? With the storytelling that, that you tell. What's one story you could share with us from the film that really, I, I'm sure they all touched your heart, but one that really stands out that you feel comfortable sharing with our viewers? It's really interesting. Um, I'm going to share a story about how I got connected to Shelly Covert, who is one of the key voices in mm. both the pilot episode, and she will be for the the final uh, release and the at least the first four episodes and potentially uh, throughout the whole series. Mm -hmm. She's a spokesperson for the Nisanon people, and she runs the nonprofit uh, Chirp the California Heritage Indigenous Research Project. And I met Shelly because of a performer whose name is Marie Sue. Mm -hmm. And Marie Sue loaned one of her songs to us to be the music in mm -hmm. the first, ep the pilot episode of Un American Justice. Mm -hmm. And Marie Sue is from Nevada City. The, the Chirp um, museum space, Ubaseo is in Nevada City. Mm -hmm. And I met Marie Sue at a concert in Napa the day that the firestorm descended on Napa and burned wow. all through the Napa Hills, all the way up through Silverado um, yeah. and up to Calistoga, if you remember that. Yes. I was there at uh, a concert at a, a Gunlock Bunshu winery mm -hmm. and met Marie Sue. And I remember a moment where she put her hand on my hand, just mm -hmm. like, a, like a, a reassuring. And that mm -hmm. physical touch has led mm -hmm. to me being very connected to the Nisanan people and uh, to Shelley Covert and her work. Mm -hmm. So my passion for the Nisanan tribe is, mm -hmm. and I really believe that this film was gonna help change the world in this way, mm -hmm. where uh, the federal government will restore recognition of the Nisanan tribe. And it's unbelievable, um, unbelievable to think that a tribe that was so um, perfect in so many ways, their community, their culture mm. was so wonderful, so peaceful and mm. so nourishing. And now they're not recognized by the federal government. And if you look at a, a map of tribes for the state of California, the Nisanan land is some of the most incredible land in the state of California. Mm -hmm. and a very large area and in 2023 they're not recognized by the federal government so that's going to change like what they need is um, for the state of california or for private individuals to buy land give it back to the nisanon people mm -hmm. so then the federal government will finally receive wow rod that's amazing i uh 
I love that that this film can be part of that effort. And and in fact, if if people feel so moved to support the effort, can they reach out to you um, to support the film or the effort of the Nissanon people? I think yes, we have sure. um, we have a link to your contact information. There it is, Rod Malloy at Gmail dot com. Yes, absolutely. I would welcome any any uh, even if it's just a question, um, mm -hmm. but any support, absolutely. Um, and especially if somebody wants to come alongside me to help bring this film to the finish line, um, that would be incredible if this podcast reaches somebody who would be inspired to do that. No, I, and I love how stories really move our hearts, which means we start to move our feet, which means we start to vote or we reach out to our legislators or we start to get that collective voice moving in such a direction that change happens. And but people got to care. And what I love is that your ability to tell the story uh, gives people that hook to care. And then when we care, then we start moving towards the solution. And so I just I just am so um, grateful that you've taken on their plight. And, and I've actually learned something I didn't know. I didn't know that the Nissanon had not been recognized. So you know, I guess I got some letters to write and people to reach out to. And uh, thank you so for that. Any help will will be helpful, and I I personally appreciate that, and I know they will as well. I recommend um, for anybody who who listens to this to uh, Google the California Heritage Indigenous Research Project and okay. to support that organization. They're a nonprofit, and to go visit their gallery in Nevada City, California. Oh, fabulous. I didn't know they had a gallery. That's amazing. I love that. Well, you know, you weren't always a filmmaker and um, we're going to get into some of that, but, uh, and we're also going to get into a very personal project that you're working on uh, related to um, some of your journey that you're really passionate about. But before we do that, we're going to take a little break. Uh, we're going to have just a quick little commercial but don't go away don't go away we will be right back and with more of rod malloy's story so come right back New Thought Media Network. We are a global broadcast network of positive music, media, and entertainment. Inspiring humanity's evolution along the journey of enlightenment and creating a world of love, peace, empowerment, and prosperity for all. New Thought Media Network. Positively inspiring. Welcome back to Change Your Story, Change Your Life. I'm your host, Mitch Austin, and I'm here with our guest, Rod Malloy, today. Rod's telling us a little bit about his documentary projects and why they're important and some of the powerful stories that he's telling uh, around the world. So, Rod, we were just wrapping up a little bit about the American Justice film, and now I'd like to kind of roll into... Uh, another project that um, started from your own personal health history. Maybe you could give us a little uh, peek into that, how that project started and, and where it's going. Sure. I lost my mom to the disease ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease um, five years, no longer than that, eight years ago, mm -hmm. and lost my uncle to the same disease, ALS, and my great aunt, uh, Georgia, to the disease. And when you have more than one person in your family uh, direct line of uh, heritage, mm -hmm. um, doctors and people who uh, know things about the human genome uh, results and where, uh, where the technology is today in terms of science and the human body, mm -hmm. you can get a simple blood test and that blood panel will tell you a lot about what you may be at risk for. And mm -hmm. I went to a, a, an ALS Cure fundraising event. ALS Cure is a nonprofit in the Bay Area founded by Mike Piscotti and his son, mm -hmm. Stephen Piscotti, who is a, a Major League Baseball player who played 
for the Cardinals and the A's. Um, Stephen lost his mother. Mike lost his wife to ALS. Mm. And um, at this event, I, I went and spoke with Mike Piscotti and Dr. Robert Bowser, who runs a clinic in Phoenix called the Barrow Institute that does mm. research trying to find a cure for ALS and other neurological diseases. Mm -hmm. And I asked the two of them if they would be willing to, if A, first thing, should I get tested? Uh, do they recommend I get tested if I had three people in my uh, in my life that had the disease? And second, if I got tested, would they be willing to be a part of it to document it for a, a film? Uh, and that, that led, that was the spark that led to I th at this point in time, uh, 28 people in, I believe it's seven states and 11 cities have been interviewed for the f documentary feature film, ALS and You. And what I've learned in the process of interviewing p uh, doctors who are uh, reaching, uh, uh, researching and trying to find a cure for this disease they're not just trying to find a cure for ALS, they're trying to find a cure for all neurological diseases. Wow. So every, every um, any LS, any lateral sclerosis, Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease, even it has tendrils into Alzheimer's through wow. the, uh, the disease FTD, which mm -hmm. is um, a frontal temporal uh, disease where um, you're, it's, has effects like uh, dementia and Alzheimer's caused by the same genetic mutation that causes ALS. Wow. So um, I, I've learned so much in the process. And most importantly, I've learned things about me, my body, because I got the test. I have the results. The results will be featured in the film. Mm. And in doing so, I'm showing to other people that it's as easy as a blood test. And I know that this subject matter scares people because I've asked my cousin Rich and my sister Becky to follow me in terms of getting tested because I didn't do it for myself. I really did it for the family tree, all the all the descendants for my two kids, for all of my cousins and their children. That's why I did this. And it's really for everybody else too. Um, because if you have three people who have had Parkinson's disease in your family or three wow. people who have had FTD or um, any of the lateral sclerosis, um, it's it actually for me getting the test results has empowered me. Um, and I knew that when I decided, when I made the choice to do it, I knew that it, it would be a good thing for me. Um, that's not true for everybody, but what's really beautiful, my sister who told me absolutely no, she didn't want to get tested when yeah. I started the process. Um, we were sitting at my niece's wedding and I was sitting with my cousin, Rich and his wife, Kathy, my sister, Becky came over to us during the, the uh, reception and she said, I've already scheduled my appointment. I'm going to get tested. Wow. So yeah. it's like do it's dominoes. It's the like yeah. the family dominoes. And the more people that get tested and share their results, the more doctors know about how diseases um, relate to a family tree and mm -hmm. also uh, potentially finding cures for specific uh, genetic mutations. Wow, and that who knows, is who knows where we go from where we go from there. I I've interviewed a father. He actually gave me really direct personal advice on film to mm. to go forward with this and how to handle the the test results. Mm. He and his wife have edited out the mutation from their children. They have guaranteed that their the I've met their daughter. Their daughter will never have ALS because with modern technology, they were able to put a couple of zygotes in a lab, analyze them, and pick the one that didn't have the genetic mutation. Wow. And then really? put, it back in the, put it back in the mom. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. So isn't that, isn't that incredible? I'm 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 sharing some things from the film that I didn't want to, but yeah. like that's a that's a story that is so incredible and uh, so inspiring, but also a little bit creepy. 
<laughs> well, I know, and, and 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 a lot of people are scared that we're going to have designer babies. But right. what if we could edit out edit out these terrible diseases that are so uh, just nightmarish? They're they're, yeah. they're beyond. Yep, that is the other side of that story that is actually inspiring mm -hmm. um, and not frightening is the fact that um, with technology, you can make that choice to not have that. And I know that that j just by that saying that itself, there are people who are going to rise up and attack because um, mm -hmm. I love all people and people that are living with disabilities are beautiful people mm -hmm. and their disabilities are part of who they are. Um, and um, I know that there are people who um, are 100% against this kind of thing mm. forever. <laughs> and that's okay. We're all in this together. Right, right. And it's such, it seems like it's such a personal decision. Um, it is. You know, whether to use technology, whether to get tested. If somebody was interested in getting tested, Rod, what should, how should they go about that? Like, what, what is the process for getting tested? Well, it, our healthcare system is so backwards and so complicated. Um, to answer that question, it's, it, there's uh, multiple layers to it. The first thing is if you have health insurance, um, you have to be very, very careful even asking the question because mm. once you open that door and your insurance company knows about it, it mm. can impact your future. Good so. Point. I did it, um, and I'm, I'm I'm comfortable being transparent with this. I did. I got my test through a clinical trial through mm -hmm. Massachusetts General Hospital, mm -hmm. and I had no health insurance at the time, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I didn't pay a, a dime out of my pocket for the test. It was all right. funded by an ALS clinical trial. So mm -hmm. the the first question is, what are you seeking? If you have a particular disease in your family history, then see if there's any clinical trials that you can participate that are like this, where you can get the testing done for free. Mm -hmm. After I learned about this, I found out that I could have gone to San Francisco to get the, the test or to Phoenix or to mm -hmm. Denver or to Minneapolis or to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. But I ended up in Boston, which uh, was meant to be. <laughs> we we went to the ALS Therapy Development Institute in Cambridge, which is the best um, organization that I and, uh, that I have experienced in terms of laser focused research to find a cure for ALS, um, and wow. that's been their mission since they were founded over ten years ago. And we've interviewed the doctors there. We've toured their lab. And right 15 minutes from Cambridge is the, the Dials Clinic at Massachusetts General Hospital, where I got my testing done and where I've had um, visits with clinicians. Wow, that's amazing. And, and from what I understand, uh, there's been a lot of serendipity on how this has unfolded. Um, people coming to you with with resources, chance encounters. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if any of those stick out in your mind, but. <laughs> so many of them, it's like all of them, Mitch. <laughs> and for both Un-American Justice and ALSNU, the best part of that um, um, sleeping to waking, uh, mm -hmm. living out your dream story is the mm -hmm. fact that when you knock on those doors and the doors open it's amazing what the universe will do like who you will meet and um like for me that universe of people that we've interviewed they're part of my extended family they're they're part of my network they're they're people that know me and there's a lot of love between all of us and, and all of those things um, talking about the american dream talking about als talking mm -hmm. about neurological diseases and it's bonded me to a whole host of people and it i have to say at this stage of my life like it has been something i needed like i needed that to really truly be hopeful in the midst of a global pandemic in the midst of wars and like all this all the the stuff that we thought was going away like aren't we at a place where the age of aquarius is here <laughs> but maybe it's Pretty not bad. here maybe yeah. it's not here quite yet because we still have wars <laughs> well but, uh, and I, think, I think we're almost there 
I think you're right. You know, I think a lot of the uh, Piscean age structures, which are hierarchical, are crumbling. We just see it. All, all these institutional structures are falling apart. And at the same time, something new is sort of coming through the ground of our society for a different way of being. And uh, Age of Aquarius is all about community. Yes. And, and I love because that's exactly what you're doing is, is you're bringing the community together to address these issues, these points of healing that need our attention. And that's really the power, part of the power of what you do and, and, and something we can all get behind, whether we're sending you 10 bucks or more or if we're just connecting you with your next interview, uh, whatever it is, um, it all adds up. And, and makes a difference so so that collectively uh, we can heal what ails us. Um, because if we just rely on, on other people, uh, then we get other people results. But when we come forward with our voice and our resources and our support, then we get a reflection of what's important to us. So I just love that you dedicated your life to this. But but what I what it feels like now is you're living your best life, but that wasn't always your story. Like before you got sick in COVID, <laughs> life was a whole different story. You were kind of a, asleep. Yeah. You know? Um and it's interesting how um really like I went I'll be transparent here too I went through a divorce and I really when I look back at it I, I never should have taken that path like that should not have been a path for me because I wanted to be married I wanted to have that relationship it was my childhood dream that had basically um, made my life very beautiful having two children and um, I was asleep. I, I, my my ex-wife says that it was the dark night of my soul, and um, I believe that that is true. So I, I was asleep, and um, now I am awake. <laughs> well, and it seems like so many massive breakthroughs kind of have that pattern of going into the dark before breaking through to the light. And, and sometimes that breakthrough looks like an incredible dream and then and then acting on that vision, taking that first step. And, and now look how far you've come. Uh, it's just phenomenal to see that and, and inspiring because I'm sure there are people who are going to watch this show who've had their own dark nights or maybe going through one right now and questioning, uh, should I be still moving forward? Uh, what's what's what is there for me on the other side of this? Is there another side of this? And what 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 piece of inspiration or advice could you give someone who's who might be experiencing that? This is uh, actually a great. You teed it up perfectly for me, Mitch. Sign up today for Rise and Speak, which starts <laughs> on November fourth. <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> Uh, or, or, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what day it starts, but it starts in November. So okay. sign up. Go talk to Mitch and sign up for it. Um, yeah. I I ended up signing up for that. Um, like the the Amani Center really helped me in a time where I needed community, and it was all virtual. And um, I found a couple of virtual communities um, during the the days of the lockdown, and seeing the class rise and speak offered by the Amani Center like I knew I had to to take it and especially because you had to I had to drive to Cameron Park California to actually go to the meetings <laughs> <laughs> which is a, a 45 minute drive each way wow. but it, it was totally worth it the people I met were incredible all of the stories in our class changed my life like they all impacted me very deeply. Mm -hmm. And I realized that when, like I went there planning to tell one story. And when I started talking to people, they were like, no, you need to tell that this story. <laughs> and the story I ended up telling is a speech entitled Silver and Gold, which I, Mitch, I want you to know this. I've shared the speech um, with several audiences since Rise and Speak. So I still, mm -hmm. I still share it and I'm, I'm still offering it to people for people who want to listen and mm -hmm. people who care. 
And mm -hmm. Silver and Gold is about my mother and father and how each of them individually in different ways made me who I am and gifted me with like royal medals, <laughs> like the silver and gold lining of, of life. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't feel that way when um, uh, after I got divorced, like when I was heading into the pandemic, going from one job to another, I didn't feel much silver and gold in my life. And now um, it's all around me. It, wow. It's spiritual. It's not physical. Uh, you know, I think you know what I mean. Like it's uh, spiritual silver and gold. Mm hmm. No, I love I love how you put that and and I and I loved working with you on that talk. It was just so rich and brilliant. And and I love how you honored your parents. I mean, these stories that we tell, we can bring to life uh things about people that we care about that that may not be on the planet anymore and bring that or even on the planet and and just testifying to how we affect one another. Um, and also how we can alchemize the experiences that we've had and, and we can speak them and honor them and reframe them in new ways. And um, yeah, I just, and, and I loved how we made the, the connection between your father dealing in precious metals and the title and the spiritual <laughs> silver and gold. It was just so beautiful. And, and in fact, if people want to hear it, Rod, could they reach out to you and have you come tell the story if, if they're, uh, interested yes, absolutely i would love i that is more that it well it is an it's a nine minute uh presentation it's uh pretty much we timed it down to nine minutes so wow. yes i'd be happy to bring a nine minute presentation <laughs> to you i also have speeches related to um energy intergenerational connections and service clubs and their impact on american culture um, uh, I'd be willing to, to do like an A and a B, like my personal story and, yeah. or show the film, the pilot, uh, uh, the pilot episode of Un-American Justice. That would be perfect. I could do the silver and gold speech and then show the film. Awesome. Oh, that would be, oh, what a nice pairing that would be. Okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. I hope, I hope that, uh, people do that. If you feel so called, uh, reach out to Rod and let him know he'll, he'll show up and, uh, He's good for his words. So I always enjoyed that about Rod. So um, we are going to get into a little more of Rod's story and defining moments as well as our signature question. But before we do, we have just one more commercial break and then we'll be back uh, shortly. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back to Change Your Story, Change Your Life. Mitch Austin here with our guest, Rod Malloy. So, Rod, what would you say? I mean, you've had quite an experience doing documentaries, and I know you had a whole professional life before you did the documentary thing. What would you say is one of your proudest moments? Wow. Um, in terms of uh, like being a father and the moments when your children are born that I don't think you can top that in terms of life moments. Um, if we're, if we can not focus on that, I can share something that is more global. Sure. Um, yeah. The, like the, the ability to create something and then have other people respond to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, the first award that we were given for just the pilot episode of Un-American mm -hmm. Justice. Um, I, it's a feeling I've never felt before. Like I really felt like um, all the, the time, effort, energy, blood, sweat, tears, meeting people, the, the love, all the love mm -hmm. that went into it, that it actually is having an impact, even if it's like a, that much of an impact. <laughs> I, I believe the film will have the final documentary series will have and like a 
Um, I learned a word this week, uh, tikkun, which is Hebrew. Mm. And it yeah. basic tikkun alam together means repairing the world. So I believe that un-American justice it will exist and will be involved in specifically repairing the world. Mm. Tikkun alam. Tikkun alam. I love that. Oh. Preparing and I, I, all of that really it just came all of that came to me recently and that gives me a pretty big reason to live <laughs> and a pretty big <laughs> pretty big reason to be positive and to keep right. moving forward and um maybe the the energy to um really to help other people when they need help uh, mm. i think is like the most important thing yeah, and there's such a gift in giving. And and I know from my own experience, uh, it gave me a sense of purpose and connection to life at a time when I didn't feel it. I didn't feel that connection until I started giving, until I started seeing people light up, until I started witnessing just the impact that this one person could have on somebody else or a group of somebody's. And for me, that's been very, very powerful as well. So I appreciate that that um, that you said that. So, um, Rod, you know, I imagine making a documentary isn't necessarily a walk in the park. I mean, when you were first putting this together, were there any moments that you thought, oh, I've bit off more than I can chew? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe right now. <laughs> well, well, it's interesting. And this is like the humor of um, like the universe and like what it means to be a human being. Like you, you have to have a sense of humor. You need to laugh at things. I've pretty much I have my career where, where I've been compensated for my expertise and my work has related to marketing and development. So you would think that I would use those skills and apply them to the films that I'm producing. Right. And um, the only, like when people push me on this, the only thing I can say is those skills I applied in other, other ways, this is a different animal. And um, the only reason why the films have gotten to the place they are is because of doors opening and asking and never giving up. Mm. And part of what that is, is uh, developing grit or developing mm. determination to see something come to a fruition. When I started the American Justice Project, I thought the film was gonna be released in 2021 and it has not been released yet. And it's, it's yeah. 2023. Mm. And I don't criticize myself or the people on our team. I don't, I'm not judging myself right. or them. I am just letting it happen and letting the doors open that are supposed to open. If I had forced it, it the film would have been a 90 minute documentary that was released in 2021 and very few people would have seen it. Mm. Now we've allowed it to open up and the story to widen and it's gonna be so much better and it will help uh, be very in instrumental in repairing a broken world. Absolutely. And, you know, there's a timing, you know, there's our time and then there's God's time, right? Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that was my plan? long, my, my long winded way of saying that. <laughs> yeah. When, yeah. when we plan, God laughs. I've heard all kinds of good ones around this. Yes. Um, and yet, um, you know, I've also heard that uh, we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what we can do in three years. And, and I think there's so much truth in that. Um, to give our ambitious plans air and time to breathe and mature and grow along with us. Because it sounds like it was a huge growing process for you. It well. was. It, wa it was incredibly. Um, and for me, it was a giant step of faith to uh, put all the resources I had into mm -hmm. Funding a a film crew of four people, uh, flying them all out, picking them up in an RV, 
driving to places like the George Floyd Memorial, Standing mm -hmm. Rock, Mount Rushmore, mm -hmm. uh, places none of us had been to before. Mm -hmm. um, what a community building experience. And it's something that for four people, we're, we'll never forget it. And we're a, we're a family, that, that group of four people, a 20 year old black Muslim a cameraman and wow. filmmaker, a Hawaiian, um, uh, Hawaiian, I, I struggle describing it because his family is royalty in Hawaii. Mm. Um, and it, his name is Enrique, and he's the cinematographer and um, editor and, and camera operator, a sound mm. guy. He and I have gone together all over the country to interview people, just a, a mighty team of two. <laughs> That's a mighty team of two. I love that. <laughs> and the, the fourth person is Liz, my friend Liz, who um, had no film experience, but became our sound editor during our film crew trip. So the four of us became a team and a, a small little community during the, the week long trip from Chicago back to Sacramento in a brand new RV. <laughs> well, I'm sure you get to know each other really well. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> when we picked up the RV, this is a fun fact. If you pick up an RV and travel travel that part of the U.S. Mm -hmm. in spring, you will not be allowed to uh, de-winterize the RV. You have to keep it winterized. Because nice. if you go through places like North Dakota, South Dakota, and the lines freeze, it's a, it's a major repair to the RV. So you cannot have running water. Uh, you have to keep it winterized. So we had no running water in our RV. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, ow. I'd ask about those stories, but yeah. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think well, I the, it, it's a simple answer. This is a beautiful American story. There are truck stops all along the interstate system in the United States of America, and they have some of the nicest showers that you ever go to. <laughs> um, so truck stops, that's uh, that's the simple answer. <laughs> you probably do a little booklet on them now. I'm sure. Just be good. And RV parks, like uh, those two things we learned a lot about. That's awesome. I don't think you can rent the RV now anymore for that price. Wasn't that kind of a serendipitous event? Is yes, uh, I've Googled it since, and the prices range from nine hundred dollars to sixteen hundred dollars to do the same thing. Just that, and even and even even more than that. So, like, what people guess is accurate. It's just this was a little gap of in the pandemic weirdness where they had nobody to drive their new RVs to dealerships. Uh -huh. So they offered it for virtually nothing. Like I, they were hiring me as an individual to deliver an RV to a dealership in Sacramento. And this is true because when I dropped the RV off, the woman there said, we've never had a brand new RV delivered to us ever. <laughs> and we've been in business for 40 years. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. <laughs> it wasn't quite so new by the time you got there. But... <laughs> it had 20, 2,300 miles on it. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. I just love how those things have lined up. You know, one thing I remember when we were talking about the ALS film that you had told me about is that... Um, there's actually more hope around a cure and some treatment for this than people might realize. Um, would you mind just sharing a little bit about that? Yes, I should know like the names of all the drugs because I've been in meetings uh, for many of them. There's mm -hmm. one that's called Neuron. There's also a drug uh, called Tolferson. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that there are drugs that have been approved by the FDA that are helping people that are living with the symptoms of ALS today. Wow. And what used to be a disease that killed somebody in six months or a year or uh, nine, whatever, uh, 15 months, very short period of time. Now people are living four, five, six, seven years 
with the disease and their their symptoms sort of plateau with the mm -hmm. drugs which is a really really incredible thing and it gives me a lot of hope for the future and there's also a group called end the legacy their mm -hmm. story is part of the als and new film because i'm part of a group of people that are part of the founders my friend gene is the founder and they are they exist to basically change the healthcare system mm -hmm. to get doctors and healthcare uh, related in insurance companies and pharmaceuticals to basically invest in preventive medicine. If there's this whole universe of people who are pre-symptomatic that are part of that, that genetic group, right. why not put them in clinical trials and, and use some of these drugs to help them? Because they may never have any symptoms. And that's pretty much getting, getting closer to a cure. That is amazing. That is amazing news. Um, and, and if people want more information about that, they can also reach out to you. I assume you're willing. Yes, to absolutely. That. I have information on, um, end the legacy. I have information on any different resources, a resource related to ALS. And if there's other neurological diseases you have questions about, I can address that as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for this powerful, powerful work that you're doing. My pleasure, Mitch. Thank you. What you're doing, uh, allowing me to share this, the, the stories and really the passion really makes me feel really good. So I appreciate yeah. you. Thank you. Well, now we come to our signature question. <laughs> so somebody's writing the book of life and they come to you to get a story from you that will provide inspiration and guidance for generations to come. What story would you give them and why? Well, when I first saw this question, I immediately thought um, silver and gold, but I mm -hmm. think it's a different story that's similar. It's whatever, mm -hmm. it's probably like diamonds and obsidian or something, like a couple, <laughs> two precious metals mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. they do exist. Like diamonds do exist. Let's say a diamond and pearl. It's the diamond and pearl story because right. my mom would be the pearl. My dad would be the diamond. And then all of their ancestors uh, that preceded them would, would share those attributes, the diamond and the pearl and things that are connected and rooted in nature that create mm -hmm. things of beauty. And mm -hmm. that would be the story. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm really talking about myself as a connection uh, to these other people and to my ancestors and to other ancestors that have made this life experience um, really, really sparkle and uh, mm -hmm. like really beautiful. Well, and and what I what I love about the theme of of you in in the storytelling and in the story in in the particular story you would put in this book is that the value there is, the richness there is in celebrating our ancestors, knowing our ancestors. Can you tell us more about that, what that means to you? It's interesting. When I was a uh, an adolescent, well, say like between the ages of 12 to 16, I knew um, very well my heritage because my parents and my grandparents told me the heritage. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a direct descendant of John Adams through my dad's family. Um, the Adams family goes basically two mm -hmm. generations before me as the surname. My, that's where the Adams in my, my uh, grandmother's name comes from. Ruth Adams Donnelly Malloy, her mother was an Adams. So um, I don't tell people about that. Like I'm not banging that banging that drum. Right. But it's something that um, as a child I was aware of it. I mm -hmm. attended uh, daughters and sons of the American Revolution meetings. Um, I uh, became an Eagle Scout. Um, mm -hmm. Most of my understanding of the world, my worldview was through the lens of family, tradition, mm -hmm. um, ancestors when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost like at my 
current age, I'm reliving those things and I'm rediscovering them and I see them through a different lens and I treat them differently. <laughs> and I, I, it's with honor, like I honor them instead of uh, simply knowing of them. I love it. I love it. And and I'm so grateful. It almost seems like it was a setup, right? You're you're learning about your ancestors as a teenager. And now, you know, a lot of your work is telling the stories of generations before us and how, how those stories played out and how they are impacting us still today and um, in, in ways that are good and not so good. So, um, right. so, so great. Yeah, we can, we can pick the, we can pick the good. And a lot of the good happens to be our grandmothers. And this oh, doesn't man. mean there's not good with the grandfathers, but um, a lot of the structures and the things that we're talking about are um, the, the male dominated uh, uh epoch like the last thousand years yes. and we're entering a new thousand years where doesn't mean the the male doesn't have a role but the feminine is going to be creating the new structures <laughs> it seems like we need to take turns right to, to be yes, a, a whole in, in our in our world or, to be whole. or get yeah. to a place where it's equally shared <laughs> yeah, where there's balance no i love that well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I want to thank New Thought Media Network for hosting this show. And we want it to keep going. So I'm going to put a little challenge out. Um, our producer is going to drop a link here for people to donate to the show. Um, even if it's just five bucks. You know, I, I have this dream that this show is going to generate all kinds of money for this organization so that we can take it to higher and higher levels. So even if you can do five bucks, just click on the link below and uh, uh, support this show and support the network um, so we can get it all to the next level. I also want to thank my producer, producer Laura Brzezinski, um, who donates her time to produce the show. I want to thank the studio I'm in, One Source 18, professional sound and video studio here in Citrus Heights, which is near Sacramento, California. If you ever have a need for professional recording, whether it's books or music or shows like this, uh, check it out. One, One Source, 18 Source Productions here in Sacramento. And uh, if you're interested in Rise and Speak, please reach out to me. If this is called to you, you know you have a story that's just beating in your heart to be told, let's get it told. Because if you don't do it now, it isn't going to happen. And I would love to support you with that. So keep telling your story, keep shining your light. And until we see each other again next Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Bye, everyone. Thanks for watching.